I don't think that I'll ever get used to being the center of attention. Whenever people look at me, my instinct is to assume that something is wrong. Growing up on the streets, you quickly learn that most attention is dangerous. Kids out here can get abused, kidnapped, or worse without provocation. Until I am very sure that someone doesn't mean me harm, I don't want them to even know I'm here. Years and years of that habit aren't going to go away, no matter how much I'm intellectually aware that I'm not in danger and that it is perfectly reasonable, at least currently, for everyone in the street to be staring at me with hanging jaws. At least I don't need to ask anyone to get out of the way. I am given a wide, wide berth. I do my best to ignore all of the eyes on my back, finally reaching the Hunter's Guild and stepping inside with a sigh of relief. Unfortunately, there are a lot of people in the Hunter's Guild as well, more than usual, and the eyes of everyone inside just snap to me instead when I make my way to the front desk. I am exhausted. Dragging this giant corpse all the way back here was almost as much work as killing the damn thing in the first place. You have anyone here that knows how to skin one of these? I ask. The receptionist, whose name I haven't learned to this day, gives me an utterly dumbfounded look instead of responding. I scowl, not at all in the mood to have to deal with this sort of thing. It's an iron shell pentarpede, I grumble. These are valuable, right? I killed it, but I don't think any of my weapons can skin it. What should I do? You are, well, we might have someone? I'll ask around. I also have a dozen or so pentarpede eggs. They're alive. I don't know if you can domesticate these or whatever, but do you think someone would buy them? You brought live monster eggs into the city? Yes. I snap. I just said that. Don't freak out about it, they're not going to hatch yet. Can I sell them or not? The receptionist just pulls a string underneath her desk that I'm fairly sure connects to a bell in the branch leader's office. This is quickly confirmed when I feel him getting up and moving down the stairs towards us. Everyone present in the lobby continues to stare at me until I turn and glower in their directions. I must look like a nightmare. I couldn't fit all of the eggs in my backpack, so I ended up making a makeshift satchel out of little disciple skin. It took me quite a few tries to put it together successfully, so most of the front of my body looks like a storm rolled through a butcher's shop. My boss finally shows up, the fat older man's eyes widening as he takes in my gruesome visage and even more gruesome cargo. Vita? Goodness, you. Have you been in the forest? No, I growl. I just found this thing wandering around in the middle of the main thoroughfare and figured I was hungry for fresh meat. He blinks, mind taking a while to catch up with the joke. I I mean, your team has been here the entire time. How did you survive on your own? I just glower at the man for a few moments before eventually deciding that I am too damn hungry to continue this inane conversation for a second longer. I drop the section of the corpse I haven't been dragging along the ground, and set down the eggs as well. Look, I just brought these back because I thought they might be useful. Do what you want with them, I'm going to get some food. I haven't eaten anything for two days. Other than souls, anyway, but they don't have to know that. I leave my confused guildmates behind, wasting no time before grabbing myself a bowl and filling it with as much stew as I'm able. Sitting down at the closest table, I start to devour it. Soon I'm onto my second bowl trying to slow down my consumption by sheer force of will so that I don't make myself sick. Now that I'm back in a familiar location, I can tell how much more range I've gotten on my soul sense just from this one outing. Another 100 yards, at least. Why have I not been doing this the entire time? I could be getting so much stronger so much faster, but I've been. What, afraid? Of the Templars that will kill me the moment they have the opportunity anyway. I don't have anything to lose anymore. I should probably just head right back out when I'm done here. Whispers flow around the mess hall as I continued to fill my belly, sounds that I would normally tune out without a thought. Today, however, it's a little more difficult to ignore since everyone seems to be talking about me. Seriously? That little girl? The body is still in the lobby if you don't believe me. She must be insane. Even senior hunters don't go out alone. Yeah, there's no way. I helped Remus train her just a few months ago. She could barely fight. Look man, I believe you, but if I felt something like her out on a job I would turn the entire team around. I don't know what else to tell you. I keep to myself, trying to hide my face behind more stew. It doesn't feel like I'm that much stronger than when I first got here. 
I suppose I've been comparing myself more against Penelope than the average person, though, and she could probably kill everyone in Skyhope if she put her back into it. Even still, a lot of these people feel like they have bigger souls than I do. Am I missing something? I push my senses into and around the souls of the few random hunters, comparing them to my own. There's definitely something different. I'm not sure how to describe it. Density? Structure? Whatever it is, I'm starting to suspect that directly comparing myself to humans might be somewhat of a misleading measurement. I'm not growing because I don't grow anymore. My tentacles are getting longer, but my core isn't getting bigger the way a human soul would. It's just changing, evolving. The realization brings a smile to my face. It's exciting, in a way. Validating. Me, as I am. It's not enough. The little street rat who got a lucky talent isn't a person that can fix the messes I made. But if I can become something more, then maybe I have a chance. Soon, my physical body can't take any more food. Which, now that I think about it, is just a terrible design feature. I can eat as many souls as I want, but I can't have as much stew as I want. The human body sucks. I exit the mess hall after cleaning my bowl with my tongue and putting my dishes away. Penelope had been called from the infirmary into the main room where I left my corpse and the eggs, where she is now arguing with the branch leader. No, don't destroy them. Hell, I'll buy them. Johan would be ecstatic to have these. If you want them, you can just have them, Penelope, I say. Vita. Something so utterly alien happens at that moment that I doubt I will ever be able to convince myself that it is real. Penelope, of all people, suddenly bolts towards me and gives me a hug. Watcher's eyes, Vita, thank goodness you're alive. You just left without a word and your mother and I couldn't find you anywhere and, holy shit you are absolutely disgusting, why did I touch you? The moment ends just as suddenly as Penelope pushes me away and starts trying desperately to wipe the monster guts off of her dress. I'm left stunned, and it isn't until Penelope finishes casting a spell to clean herself that the world seems possible again. Hi? I managed to say. Don't look at me like that. We were all worried about you. Did you? Did you really kill this? I shrug. It had to protect its nest so it couldn't move very well. But yes. I did. By yourself? I raise an eyebrow. No, I assembled a small army. Didn't you see the levy? I keep my words thick with sarcasm so everyone else will misinterpret them, but by the pause in the song of Penelope's soul, I know she understands what I really mean. I'm hum. And where is your army now? She answers playfully, not outwardly betraying a hint of anything other than a continuation of the joke. Disbanded, I reassure her. What, does she think I'm just going to leave an undead army outside the gates? I ate the lot of them. Sorry I made you worry, I guess. I just needed to burn off some steam. I admit, I do feel a lot better with a full belly and well over a hundred souls newly digested. However, while I can almost feel the raw grouchiness fading away in the aura of my food coma, my thoughts of relaxation are quickly dashed. Angeline's soul rubs up against mine, pressed tightly against me just like Penta's. I don't have the luxury of calm. I don't have time. It's starting to get a bit tight inside my body, and with all the human souls I've been picking up whenever I come across one, I'm worried I'll run out of storage space. What am I going to do when I can't physically fit any more? Do I start turning them into revenants? Or do I just start eating them, like the Mistwatcher would be doing anyway? That's a problem for future Vita. Present Vita has more than enough problems all on her own. The branch leader hurries over to me again, and thankfully it feels like he's calmed down quite a bit from the last time I saw him. Ah, Vita. So, we can certainly help you with managing quality materials like this, but I feel the need to remind you that the guild is currently understaffed and incredibly busy dealing with matters of security for the country. We've lost a lot of good hunters to the creatures that Hiver Rock dropped on us, so I would like to emphasize the importance of taking a structured, planned mission if you feel the need to venture out into the forest again. I am certainly impressed by your performance, however, and surprised. I would have assumed your team working together would have struggled with an adult iron scale. I frown at him, declining to answer the obvious question and instead asking my own. Do you have a specific job you need me for right now? Uh, no, we are waiting for another team to get back before we... Okay, 
Are there any smaller jobs I can do, or something? If you have work, I'll work. But if you don't, I'm going back out there. He, Penelope, and the smattering of onlookers don't seem to have a response to that. I feel the rest of my team moving closer, perhaps alerted by someone that I'm here or maybe just noticing the general commotion I seem to be causing. They enter the room, each apparently relieved to see me but somewhat intimidated by the heavy atmosphere. It's the branch leader who breaks the silence again. The portly middle-aged man is clearly having a difficult time coming up with something to say, taking a high level of caution and care with his words like he thinks they could somehow injure me. Vita. I know you're having a difficult time right now. I'm aware of some of the events from the other day, but, I think at least for a little while, it will be better if you get rest. Waste of time, I dismiss. Well, I need hunters available. Moving in smaller groups has just led to casualties. We are withdrawing and doubling up teams to deal with these Hive Rock threats from now on, and I need your team on standby for the moment your partners return from their mission. This is not a good time for haste. We have learned that the hard way. Every moment you waste is a moment those black-toothed monsters are getting stronger, I argue, but whatever. You're the boss. I'll be sure to check back more often. Will that be enough? Vita, quit being a fucking moron, Nora says, finally speaking up. I glance her way. Honey, you're grieving, she continues. You're not thinking straight. This. She motions at the pentarpede corpse. It's not you being efficient. It's you butting your head into a wall so you don't have to think about pain. It's a miracle you survived out there and you know it. I smirk which doesn't seem to be the reaction Nora was expecting. It's not a miracle. It's just what I can do when I don't have to worry about people selling me out to the church. Fuck, Vita, Orville grumbles, if you could do this kind of shit the whole time and you've just been holding back, I'll be pissed. I've been holding back, I answer bluntly, because you all hold me back. Orville flinches. Hey, Nora growls, we are your team. We are your friends. Don't give us a load of shit and push us away. Penelope clears her throat. I, I don't think she means it that way. I think she's saying she's actually forced to limit her talent so she doesn't accidentally hit us with it. Isn't that right, Vita? I sigh. Right. Gotta keep the cover. At this point I almost feel like it would be worse for Penelope than for me if the truth got out. Maybe not. I'm just struggling to care. I'm tired of hiding this. I should be out fighting not wasting my energy here. Yeah, I lie. Sorry guys, it's nothing personal. It's just way easier to kill stuff when I'm by myself because I don't have to worry about collateral. If I let loose, all of you would die. Shots of fear erupt in my senses all around me. It feels like just yesterday I wouldn't have had a chance in hell to pick up emotions from strangers. Now I'm not even trying and I still manage to do it. The lie does the trick, at least, and it's not even entirely a lie anyway. The rise in fear is accompanied by a drop in confusion, presumably from people putting together the incorrect picture of how I slew a powerful monster by myself. Talents. So horribly, incredibly unfair. Only Bentley feels truly unfazed by what's going on. Penelope knows how I actually killed the monster, or at least a lot more of the truth than anyone else. I look forward to seeing how she reacts to my new kind of soul shard. Yet Bentley believes the lie and it doesn't feel even a hint of fear at the revelation. In fact, he approaches me, towering over my head with the nearly two feet he has on my height. Um, I know you don't normally like it. Bentley begins, but can I give you a hug? I blink. Well, at least he's asking this time. Sure, I allow, against my better judgment. He doesn't pick me up like I expected, leaning down to wrap his arms around me and rest his chin on my shoulder. Bentley has always been a happy guy, and in a lot of ways I tend to ignore him because of that. His optimism is often annoying, and I find myself struggling to respect anyone as stupid as he is. I consider Bentley a friend, and have ever since the first day when he showed me the mess hall, but he's the sort of friend that I spend more time being frustrated with than actually appreciating the company of. I don't know if that's a common or normal sort of friend to have, but I certainly have had plenty of people like that in my life. People like all friends, but ignore. Bentley might not be the smartest, but he certainly never ignores anyone. I really shouldn't look down on him. Sometimes, he understands things a lot better than I do. Angeline would never want you to do this, he says. My body goes rigid. 
My first instinct is to yell, to accuse him of barely knowing the girl for a couple hours, but really I know I can't say I spent much more time with her either. He continues to speak, driving the stake further. She loved you. When you love someone, you don't want them to be hurt. You don't want them to die. You don't want them to blame themselves for things that aren't their fault. Angeline is your sister, so she loves you. Please don't go back out alone. I didn't get hurt. I'm fine. But it's still dangerous. You don't have Penelope to heal you. You don't have Nora to protect you. You don't have Orville to back you up. All of us care about you too. Please don't go back out alone. Please don't blame yourself for what happened. I swallow. I could have stopped it. It's no longer about the forest and we both know it. But I could have stopped it. That's simply a fact. I messed up. I was too slow, too foolish. Nothing Bentley can say will change that. I was there when she died. I could have stopped it. But Bentley doesn't disagree with me. You are not who she would blame, is all he says. He doesn't add anything after that, and neither do I. Everything still hurts. No amount of words will change that. I want to go out and get things done. I can't let myself stop moving again. I'm so scared that if I let myself rest I'll just evolve back into the lazy, passive nobody that never puts any work into anything, and this will all happen again. Maybe some less deadly work wouldn't be remiss, though. I do lose everyone if I bite it. Maybe there's some work I can do in the city? I ask. It's a long shot. Hunters are fundamentally people that operate outside the walls. But we're also more or less fancy mercenaries, and sometimes people will come with requests for problems within the city. The branch leader clears his throat. Well, we have a few, actually. Some things that are nearby that you could do? If you're absolutely sure that you aren't tired? I haven't slept in days, but no, I'm not tired. I recently gorged myself on well over a hundred souls, many of which were quite powerful. My body is sore and slow but my soul only wants to keep going. What are they? I ask. Only then does Bentley release me from his hug, the branch leader handing me a folder which I immediately pass to Penelope. Read this for me, I demand. She glowers at me. Don't you know how to read? Yeah, I admit, but I'm really slow. You're faster. Grinding her teeth a little, she complies. The jobs are horrendously boring, most of which boil down to pest control. I may as well be spending my time hunting rats. I start to tune out a little, until one of the things Penelope says catches my ear. Say that one again, I order. She sighs dramatically, but complies. Strange noises coming from sewage exflow channel 463, Penelope recites, enunciating dutifully. Suspected to be squatters or monsters, intelligent enough to avoid detection. Scout requested. I'll take that one, I confirm turning to leave immediately. Wait, Penelope calls. I turn back towards her just to watch her finish casting a spell, pulling the majority of the blood and guts off of my face and armor. There, now you won't look like a tiny serial killer, she says. Drop by our place soon, would you? I've collected quite a few tasks for you in the interim. I nod. Good. The more progress we make, the better. That actually gives me an idea. I walk over to where I left the eggs on the floor, pointing to a bunch of them. Since you want them anyway, keep these six for us and bring them. Penelope raises an eyebrow at me. Sorry, which six? I glance down with the eyes in my head, realizing that I've been pointing with one arm and five tentacles. I point out the other five with my finger, mumble an apology, and then head on out. Moving at a brisk walk for about a block. I break into a full sprint the moment I'm out of sight from the Hunter's Guild. The city has a lot of sewage, and therefore a lot of sewage exflow channels. I would have no hope of recognizing the majority of them by number, but I know a couple since they happen to be near where I live. For example, number 463 would be the channel closest to the shack. It's probably unrelated, but if it's not, well, let's just say I'm in deep shit. I feel it before I reach the exflow tunnel and my fists clench so hard I nearly bleed myself with my nails. The revenant I made out of Grig's son, that fucking murderer, is still functional after I told the damn thing to kill itself. With tendril strengthened arms I practically throw the cover to the sewer entrance open, jumping down with a wet splatter into a feces-filled tunnel, sinking knee-deep. According to what I can feel, that arsehole is down here, 
presumably having brought the other corpses and hidden them a few days ago like I ordered. He was supposed to kill himself, too, but his soul is barely cracked. His body must hardly be damaged at all. Did my order not take? No, this should be within my power. My shard seems to have integrated just fine, as well. What the fuck happened? I walk right above where I feel the soul, reaching my hand down into the sewage. I grab hold of something, pulling the familiar corpse up out of the muck. The fucker is a disgusting mess, with chunks of skin peeling off his face and sewage seeping into the muscle to help it rot. Yet he is as alive as anything I can make, and when I pull him up he staggers to his feet under his own power, stammering like a fool. M. Miss Vita. I I am so sorry, I tried to. Why the fuck are you alive? I snarl, grabbing the kid by his throat. I tried to do what you said. The boy whines. But I couldn't. I couldn't figure out how to die. Oh, okay. Let me help you then. I toss him into the wall of the tunnel, striking out with a kick to his skull the moment he slumps over. I'm no pugilist, but my body is strong and reinforced by powerful tendrils and plenty of pent-up rage. My foot hits with a crunch, chitin armored boots meant for stomping through the jungle connecting hard enough to pop him like a grapefruit. Or at least what should have been hard enough, but it's actually my boot that shatters instead of his skull. The chitin breaks into pieces, cutting up my toes a little and leaving my murderous revenant seemingly unharmed. Well, I rip some more skin and muscle off, but that stuff isn't doing anything anyway. My eye is narrow. You have a durability talent, I immediately deduce. You arm. Um, why yes Miss Vita, I, I tried stabbing myself, drowning myself, and starving myself, but nothing seemed to work. I'm so sorry. I don't know how to follow your orders, Miss Vita. God damn it. Half of those things wouldn't kill a revenant anyway, but if he can't break himself. You're about as good at dying as you are at baking bread, I seethe. Are you sure your talent isn't just being worthless at whatever you're told to do? Stand up. He gets to his feet. What's left of his lower lip trembling as I start to circle around him. I suppose this means his soul is anchored to his body's bones. His talent either reinforces bone or it reinforces all of him, and the rest of his non-bone body just isn't considered him anymore. Does he have two talents, or does he have one that encompasses both strong bones and blunt force child murder? In retrospect, I should have seen this coming. This kid got the shit kicked out of him by Grig hard enough for me to hear it through a brick wall and he barely got bruised. Grig probably would have killed a child without a talent like this. Fuck, for all I know he did. It's a mercy that the family can't reproduce anymore. What's your name? I ask. He doesn't really deserve a spot in my memory, but if I'm lucky I'll just forget it later. I need something to call him, for now. J. Jutty, Miss Vita. Jutty, I say evenly, you killed my sister. The horror that washes over my revenant's face is equal parts satisfying and infuriating. Does he care because he realizes he's a monster or does he only care because my shard is making him obsessed with me? I guess the end result is the same either way. I'm so sorry. I remember being so angry, I just wanted to. No. No, I'm so sorry. Please let me make it up to you. Make it up to me. I laugh. You want to fucking make it up to me? You can't even die like you're supposed to, you're gonna make me do that for you too. There is nothing you can do for me other than ending your disgusting existence. I understand, the murderer answers. I'm ready to be accepted by the Mistwatcher. I blink, momentarily stunned by the absurdity of that line. He's religious? Of course he is. I've never really picked anyone's brain about that before. It might be funny. Accepted by the Mistwatcher. I ask innocently. What do you mean? W. Well, the Mist Watcher takes us back when we die, he explains. He guards and shepherds the next world, escorting new souls to their bodies and old souls to heaven. Oh, wow. That sounds nice. Are you looking forward to it? I suppose it'll be nice to see my dad again. He's dead, isn't he? I smile a little at that, tendrils squirming invisibly into the murderous kid's body. Oh yes, he's very dead, Jutty. But you won't be seeing him again. What? I grab what's left of the boy's collar and pull downward, forcing him to meet me eye to eye. There is no afterlife in the Mistwatcher's jaws, I promise him coldly. His eyes go wide. It's funny, I doubt a single sentence would convince any normal person that their religion is false. 
My revenants, however, trust me completely. Jutty knows the truth of my words because I'm the one speaking them. This is how I will make him hurt. Nothing awaits you. Even if the Mistwatcher had any interest in bringing you to some kind of reward after death, you'd never make it. I'm your god, not that thing. I'm going to peel your soul apart, sliver by sliver, and crush it to dust until not a single aspect of the person you were remains. His whole world comes apart in that moment. I see it on his face and I feel it in his core. I, but the Mistwatcher, he. He has to. His protests don't amount to anything, because of course I know he doesn't even believe them. I grab his soul, using a few tendrils to hold it in place while one begins to chip away at it. Still inside a body, Jutty remains awake as I start to crack his very being. Judging by his reaction, I suspect it is excruciatingly painful. You killed my sister, I tell him again. Apologize to me. I'm sorry. The boy cries. I didn't know. Fractures dance up his core, and a scream erupts from his lips as I grab hold of these new, jagged grooves, and rip a soul shard out of him in much the same way I'd pull one out of myself. Of course, as a simple human, his soul is not at all built for such things. You didn't know? I press. You broke a child's neck. What didn't you know? That you would be punished for it? No, I. Whatever words he was going to say are cut off as I pull another shard out of him, eliciting another scream. Did you not know that the child you killed mattered? Did you just think she was some street rat? Do you think that means you can do what you want with her? Stop screaming. His incessant noises cease immediately, becoming silent gasps as the pain of impending annihilation continues to overwhelm his mind. You killed my sister, I remind him a third time. Why you killed my father? He chokes out. I scowl. What, did I break some actually important part of his undead soul, so now he can sass me? Or is the pain just so much that it's overwhelming the mind control? Doesn't matter, I suppose. I ate your father, I correct him, ripping off another shard and smashing it to dust. You don't even deserve that. Fuck you. Jutty shouts. Careful, I hiss. You'd better choose your last words carefully, or else I'll just make you change them. Into something like. Ah, I know. Where's your mum? There it is. Despair, terror, hopelessness. Complete and all-consuming. I've killed people who've fucked with me, but this is much more than that. He tries to reach his arms up and cover his mouth, but all I have to do is repeat myself. Tell me where your mother is, Jutty. S.H.E. begs on Falsad Street. His mouth barks, betraying him. We sleep in some of the abandoned shacks by the defunct Kitan farm. See? I sneer at him. Now those are some good last words. I shatter him, and then I shatter the pieces until nothing is left. I have no interest in making anything that was once him into part of me. Letting the corpse drop into the outflow channel, I let out a sigh of satisfaction. I don't know if that counts as justice, but it certainly was. Cathartic. My heart thunders, fingers clenching and unclenching. I did it. I thought he was dead before, but I know for certain now. I should have just done this the first time. With some deep breaths of foul sewer air, I'm slowly starting to calm down, minutes passing in silence. Getting the knowledge out of him was fun and all, but I of course don't actually have any plans to kill his mother. As far as I know, she's never done anything to me. It might be a good idea to go find her and see if she's plotting some sort of inane revenge, but at this point a career widow with no apparent skills probably isn't any form of threat. The whole thing was worth it for the look on his rotten, fucking face, though. And I got the job done for the Hunter's Guild. This didn't go too badly. Now, I suppose, I should go to the next item on my agenda, which would be checking up on the revenants I actually like. I guess I may as well make the entire trip via the sewers, since I would draw way too much attention being covered in shit. While I don't know the sewers anywhere near as well as I know the streets, I can tell more or less where we are by the collection of souls above me. Wherever large concentrations of people are in the line, I know that's a major street and I can figure out which street it is just from knowing the city. I hit more than a few dead ends along the way, but a few hours later I find what I suspect is going to be the closest sewer exit to Penelope's Revenant Research Facility. There are a couple people milling about, but they quickly leave when I emerge, smelling like death. I quickly run out, unlock the doors, and make my way downstairs. It's me. I call out. As per tradition, 
Vitima jumps onto me from her hiding spot above the door, though this time she swerves at the last second, kicking off the wall to avoid touching me. She lands a good distance away, skidding to a stop and turning to face me as the other two revenants emerge from their hidey holes. Whoa! Hey there, mum. You, ah, kind of look like shit. And smell like it, Theodora comments. Huh? Can revenants smell? They can obviously see and hear, so I don't know why they wouldn't be able to. It just seems weird for some reason. Margaret and Theodora are both covering their noses, so. I guess they can smell. I'm personally not much bothered by the sewage, so maybe they can smell even better than I can. My bad, I say, shrugging. Hunt a job in the sewers. I had to kill a monster down there. So how have things been going? Sorry I dropped off the map for a couple days. I've been in the forest. Have you all held up okay? Well enough, Theodora says slowly. Margaret and I have had a breakthrough on figuring out soul sight, and we're slowly coming up with a workable spell. I look over at Margaret because she starts squirming at that, like the smallest kid in a gang trying to work up the courage to ask for extra food. That's great news, I say honestly. You got something else to say, Margaret? Um, well, Penelope finally got her hands on a couple more bodies, and I was sort of hoping to get one of them. What's wrong with? Oh, right, I remember. You want to be in a dead woman instead of a dead old man. Yeah, doesn't matter to me at all. Go grab the body and I'll swap you over. Margaret beams, excitedly rushing off into another room. Honestly, I almost forgot that she's in an old man's body in the first place. She just feels like Margaret to me, and Margaret feels like a woman. That kind of thing is yet another aspect of souls that I didn't use to be able to determine very well, but now I find it pretty obvious even for people I've never met before. I guess it's not always obvious. Most people don't have a super strong impression one way or the other, and some people, like Song, leave no impression whatsoever. Margaret, though, is unambiguously female at least according to whatever the fuck my soul sense is using to determine that. I can't say I understand it, but it's never been wrong before. It occurs to me, suddenly, that I have at some point entirely stopped recognizing people by their faces and started recognizing them by their souls instead. I don't think I even look at someone's face when I talk to them much anymore. I don't know when I started doing that. Hey, souls are a much more convenient thing to pay attention to anyway. Theodora casts a few spells to start cleaning the shit off of everything, myself included, while we wait. Soon enough, Margaret brings me her preferred corpse, so I rip her out of her current one and plop her into that. Now she looks like a dark-skinned older woman who seems as though she probably didn't work out very much in life. A mage or noble, perhaps, as though she's somewhat aged she doesn't look old enough to have died from it. She could likely either afford cosmetic biomancy treatments or perform them herself. Well, back when she was alive, I mean. I don't really care what this body used to be anymore, because now it's Margaret. The revenant soul spreads its web of fibers around the inside of the corpse, and soon enough Margaret is up and moving again. How does it feel? I ask. Margaret flexes her hands, gropes at her chest, and slaps a hand back and forth between the inside of her thighs. Way, way better. She assures me, grinning and daring to give me a hug. I let her more out of apathy than any particular interest. Vitamin then hops up and decides she wants to hug as well, but from her I absolutely reciprocate. I grab her out of the air and give her a big squeeze. While I'm here, I say, would one of you check me to see if it's safe to start learning to channel mana? I think I've gotten pretty damn good at these cancel command thingies. Ooh. Sweet. Vitamin cheers. Magic mum. I would be surprised if you figured it out this early. But I can test you, I suppose, Theodora offers. I nod, happy it's her. She's less afraid of me, now, but should hopefully still be cautious enough to not consider falsely inflating how skilled I am at this. Not that it matters a whole lot, since I want Penelope to be around for the final bout of training either way. The odds of Penelope not being as blunt and critical as possible are pretty slim. I start wiggling my fingers around and humming the vocal cancel at the same time. Theodora approaches me and shoves me backwards, causing me to stumble but not preventing me from continuing the symbols. My voice doesn't even waver. That's actually not bad, Theodora says. A lot of the other tests can be pretty painful. Do you want me to run through them on you? 
I nod. Theodora, for a moment, radiates an almost disturbing contentment as her natural soul and my added shard sit in harmony for a rare, glorious moment, I think that means she wants to hurt me. Later, I conclude that is absolutely what it means, but at least I pass her magic tests. Next step, channeling. 